skeptical person with a lot of critical sense. What do you think is uh, uh, maybe, in your opinion, what do you feel is more promising, more worth the effort to, to, to get in among all these different primitives, if there is any, and which one for you is basically, you feel like maybe a dead end? If you had to get into this, which horse would you probably bet on? So we shall be horses first. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, all the primitives and combined together, for example, the idea of uh, uh, sharing UTXO in clever ways with punishment, not punishment, the, the difference between uh, um, punishment uh, and symmetry that makes the cup easier, or the client's validation idea that we will uh, uh, get more into later, or the, I mean, uh, have you, uh, how, how do you feel about the hype around ARC and stuff like that? Yeah, so, I mean, as you said, I tend to be very skeptical, very uh, conservative in general, so. I, I should mention, first of all, I'm not really keeping up with, you know, ARC, uh, BTM, all the new cool stuff. Um, but, yeah, again, for a good reason, because I think it's, uh, it takes time to get these things ready for production. And so instead of spending a lot of um, time understanding them, learning them, and then we need to change them uh, to get them ready for production, I just delay studying them until they are ready, until they are almost done. Um, so, with this caveat out of the way, I would say, in general, I think my layer 2 <laughs> protocol, my still favorite layer 2 protocol is probably Lightning, because I think we can still uh, improve on it a lot, especially with Taproot, so if we can get PTLCs, especially uh, merged, I think it, it can still do a lot of really cool things. Um, so, in general, I think sharing it, so probably with, with punishment, uh, because I think you need some kind of incentive not to cheat compared to L2 where anybody can try and worst case they just settle on, on the real state of the system. I think that's still my favorite uh, protocol. Uh, but again, I hope maybe these guys can convince me during the panel that there's something better. So I'm, I'm interesting, interested to learn more. So I will move to Adam now. I mean, Adam needs no introduction. He was a Bitcoiner before Bitcoin. And uh, uh, oh. Okay. Uh, my question to Adam would be, do you feel that the comparison that uh, Peter put together may leave some important primitive out? Are you, uh, for example, you are one of the people involved with the promotion of the idea of side chains uh, back, uh, back in the time. Side chains like a, a kind of beauty so sharing, but it's different because you are not sharing among a limited number of, of uh, set parties but you're basically sharing with other people that come in and out later so it's, it's way trickier and the side chains also require some kind of pay out mechanism that could also interplay with the uh, single use seal and rgb discussion so well my general question would be do you think there are other primitives that we are uh, that peter was uh, uh, overlooking or not stressing as you would like uh, uh, which may be related with uh, your current work on liquid, your, uh, your past work on uh, general side chains, or your future work in other concepts? I mean, I guess the building block that didn't exist when Bitcoin was launched uh, is interesting, but not scalable enough yet, is the uh, zero knowledge proof of, of executions, so like general circuits. Um, so the one that has the characteristics closest to Bitcoin security assumptions and has the bulletproofs and so blockstream is more working on that and we released a paper called Bulletproofs Plus Plus which has got some uh, incremental optimizations of scalability and efficiency but those are still uh, log scaling and not, not so cheap to verify and there are other ones called Starks I think the proofs tend to be a bit big there and the VM that people have been talking about is actually the idea that you would not prove something to the chain, but you would put some money in escrow, and then if the prover makes a false claim, you can disprove that much more compactly by just showing a knuckle path and some inconsistent clause in a big proof frame. Um, so I think that might eventually be useful. I mean, uh, the zero sync proposal is an example where it starts to be useful because it makes a proof of it allows you to download a UTXO snapshot, say up to a soon valid height, and then receive a, a single watch proof that all of the transactions before are correctly formatted and 
refer to actual previous transactions and so on. Um, so that can help, help uh, reduce the cost of syncing a node. Uh, I think generally, um, I mean, people will probably come up with some new ideas that surprises us, like the BitVM idea, that it seems like that didn't occur to anybody, but there's nothing like, fundamentally new in it, so it's surprising how uh, new ideas still arising. And I think incrementally what's tended to, what's emerged in the last year or so is use of Lightning as a, a connector protocol between different layer teams. And that has sort of made all of the layer teams more connected. Um, so one example is um, Bolts HQ. So they were doing submarine swaps between Bitcoin and Lightning main chain. And then the, the fee spiked because the ordinals and they hacked so layer 1.5 suddenly, they made a, a submarine swap from liquid Bitcoin to Lightning, and you know, nobody expected it. It's still a trustless API. Of course, you know, there are different security trade-offs in these three layers, right? But now, you know, even after the fees have gone down, apparently about 60% of the volume is liquid Bitcoin to Lightning swaps. And the interesting thing to observe is that these like adoption things happen in quick spurts when things are failing. Like the, the service startups tend to be not very proactive. They react when things break and they use what's available at the time to build something. So I'm guessing the next thing that could happen is you know, the cost of opening channels gets expensive because that swap is still an on-chain channel. It's just you can rebalance it and layer one by So I think the next thing that might happen is um, like bridges from Lightning and Liquid, which is also possible. And you know, with a layer 1.5, you can push it a bit harder. I mean, it's still a blockchain, but you you know it's opt-in, and you could you could reasonably have the full nodes require more resources. Uh, I think the longer term sort of direction I like is simplicity, um, the soft forkable script upgrade for Bitcoin, and effectively it's kind of logic microcode to allow you to implement new opcodes. And I feel that some of the current like exploration of layer 2 space is sort of partly constrained by the opcodes we have, or small incremental opcodes we could build, and then the lobby, you know, say, well, we could build this really cool use case if we had this, like Allen Symmetry or Lightning itself. So, with simplicity, you get a uh, free form, so it unlocks a lot of imagination, and you can just implement the opcodes immediately and try it. Out. Thanks. Maxim Orlowski, so you are working actively on client set validation. The last slide on Peter, that's what you have been working on mostly in the last, uh, in the last years. And my guess would be, but correct me if I'm wrong, that you will uh, agree with him about uh, this uh, way being, uh, being one of the most promising for scalability and privacy. But you would probably disagree with Peter on the uh, on the aspect that nobody yet figured out how to peg out Bitcoin from such a system. So uh, uh, am I right? Do you do you think you have the solution to to the final challenge by Peter's presentation? Uh, I wouldn't say that the challenge is solved, but I would like to say that there are options how it can be addressed. So starting from the beginning, like uh, comparing to what Peter said. Basically, basing on these ideas which he put out with a single use of client side validation back nearly a decade ago, or coming, coming to that stage, like it was 2014, 15, yeah, so it's a decade ago nearly. Mm -hmm. uh, we managed to build a, an RGB which he mentioned and which has become like it's Turing complete, but Turing completeness is not the thing actually. Everybody, it's over hyped the thing because. You can have a true incompleteness just by moving sands, uh, stones over the sands on the beach, but it's not practical. Like it will take more than a lifetime to do that. So pretty much, uh, for now, it seems that BVM is a bit in the same direction. So true incompleteness you have everywhere, nearly everywhere. The problem is that how it can be applied, and uh, well, we try to do it applicable. We can have introspection into Bitcoin state. We can do not just assets, we can do many, many different things. And the most important part, that RGB is done in a way that it is sharded. So one of, one of the responses of Peter to the idea we shared about the client side validation layer one in Bitcoin at least was that we need a sharding solution. But 
the, the case is that with RGB, we now have the sharding solution where each RGB contract is sharded uh, with other contracts fully isolated in the state and the history. And the interesting thing that all these years, we had a lot of discussions with Giacomo and other people, how to do a layer, which is layer one, which will be perfect for client-side validation, because we don't need a lot of things which we have in Bitcoin blockchain for that, they're excessive, and we don't have a scalability, is there a way? So Peter was the one who started the brainstorming this idea, we continued, and we've been stuck for many years in that direction, because there is, the idea is simple, but there is a lot of difficulties and limitations that come up with it. And it happened that when we were doing sharding for RGB, we created a primitive called multi-protocol commitments. The idea was how we can put, uh, like, with RGB, you assign state to a uh, Bitcoin UTXO, which is single use. And nothing prevents multiple different con contracts to assign the state to the same UTXO. So when you close it, you need to create a single commitment, but to multiple contracts, which you would like to isolate from each other. So we had this thing called Ancor that creates an Oracle tree with a proof of inclusion or non-inclusion. And you can basically play with this primitive. And eventually we understood that using this primitive, we can bring it to the layer one. And with this primitive, basically what Peter was describing with a um, uh, three, three chain, three chain, yeah, three chains, it basically can happen now. So you have a state and sharding solved, it's on top, and you can have a fully stateless layer one which actually can go better than log n even. It's like log 1, you publish Merkle root plus some accessory data that they are fixed size, and you have chains of this Merkle root. So if with a blockchain everyone validates everything, you have O n squared, with a client-side validation uh, you validate only your history and nobody else validates it. But you have a chain of Merkle roots and then you have client-side proofs which can be reduced to just 64 bytes per block. The bad thing that you have certain interactivity requirement, you or somebody else have to collect for each block so these proofs for you and they become part of your history even when you don't transact. But the good thing that even without zero knowledge you can aggregate them such that even the growth of the data with a boom filter. Basically, instead of taking the Merkle path, for proving inclusion or non-inclusion, you use some more advanced boom filtering such that you reduce it not to log n, but to the constant size. And basically that's what the prime uh, concept is about, is basically Peter's idea has combined, like separated everything that went into RGB and using some of these new primitives to enhance the layer one. So this, challenge, this thing I think is solvable. So we can have a layer one for the commitments, and as Andrew Pelser told one day that blockchain is good for one thing, it's a history, provable history of commitments. And we don't need anything more than that. And we can have that in a scalable and play in private way with the prime. But the problem is how to move Bitcoin. And uh, what Peter said that how to move Bitcoin in client-side validation, but I would say specifically how to move Bitcoin in RGB. And it's not the problem how to move it in, because you can burn and just issue. The problem is how to be able still to move it trustlessly out. And right now there is, I do agree that there is no cryptographically secure solution, which wouldn't require a software. Uh, however, what we can come up with is cryptographically, a crypto economically, crypto economically secure solution. Pretty much the same like that of Nakamoto consensus, and we have a crypto economic security with Bitcoin issuance today, and that works quite well. So basically, if you can have an open set of participants who decide is on pegging out, and you can have a crypto economic gain such that if they cheat, you can slash them on the stake, so you have over collateralized system. And uh, this state is located not on Bitcoin blockchain, but in, in some other system. So you can, so with RGB Prime and Bitcoin having three different systems, you can set up such a game, and we call this uh, idea Radiant. Radiant, so, which was uh, presented in Amsterdam right now. Right? Yes, well, it was a few days ago presented by Olga, and it basically comes up with a Radiant Prime, which is kind of way how you can kill blockchain and relieve, release blockchain out of chains from blockchain. <laughs> so marketing is always about killing things, basically. Yeah. 
so Peter, back to the original club, uh, seal clubber basically. Uh, I would ask you basically, since your best role is the one of the naysayer, uh, to uh, if you don't have anything uh, other to add, to criticize, uh, or to interact, or to give your opinion on some of the ideas, let me give a, a brief like uh, uh, summary. Alecos, uh, Alecos point was more like, instead of following these uh, hypothetical things, let's improve gradually what actually works with would be like. And which I will also, it's also a point that I will probably twist into, into a second point, which is Lightning Network is not just a UTXO sharing uh, mechanism, it's also a an atomic routing mechanism across different kind of UTXO, UTXO sharing mechanism. One is just the trivial channel 2 of 2 with multi sig punishment and option. But in theory you could route through, uh, you could write through arcs, uh, uh, unilateral channels, bilaterals. The second objection, the well, second point by Adam would be that uh, we would have a greater option if we change the script to something more flexible like simplicity. I know you have very strong opinions on simplicity. And then Maxim is basically claiming that there is a, another even more extreme kind of optimization when you go uh, to basically log one, which is similar to some way to three chains, and that uh, we could do, we could use crypto economics to go to move back and forth. Alex? I just wanted to like clarify maybe my position. So first of all, yeah, I said I'm not keeping up because keeping up with the new things because I think we can we still have margin to improve the existing ones. But the other uh, reason why I'm not keeping up with those is that I think most of them will be very, very hard to actually activate on chain. Like, I would like to remind everyone that we had to fight uh, to activate Taproot, which we, we all agreed Taproot was, was right, and we ended up arguing over the activation method of Taproot. So then you can come up with these very interesting, you know, very advanced schemes, but those are even more invasive changes to Bitcoin. Like, if you come with simplicity, you come, you know, and I think it will be very, very hard to in practice, activate those. So, again, maybe I'm just too skeptical. For the time being, I still see all of those as exercises of what ifs. Like, what if we had this on Bitcoin? But I think bringing them actually on Bitcoin would be very, very hard. So, that's also why I'm not really. I think covenants are doable, but again, it's going to take a while. Um, but all the more esoteric solutions. I don't know, I'm very skeptical that we are ever going to see them on video. So, yeah, yeah I, I, I think I tend to be in agreement where, you know, there's so much more to be done with Lightning as it is. You know, when I look at someone like Arc, it's just, it's so complex. You know, trying to imagine how difficult it would be to actually write this in code and have all these different moving parts all at once. You know, this could easily be a 10 year project, um, depending on how it shapes out. And you, know, you just gotta look at the list of titles of pages that they haven't written for the standard. It, it's, it's incredible how much complexity there is there. So, it's all interesting stuff, but personally I'd be much more inclined to go work on stuff that you know, already exists or is already close to. Tapper channels being a great example. Um, also there's a lot of stuff around Lightning where we haven't seen it break down in reality. Like we've never, on Lightning had a circumstance where a lot of people, or even probably really anyone, tries to go exploit Lightning channels at scale. Certainly people have tested the um, justice transaction mechanisms, but I, as far as I know, no one seriously tried exploiting this. And we'll probably go learn that these things are not as secure as we expect them to be. Um, there's probably edge cases that are wrong about them. Um, I know there's been um, exploits around RBF um, behavior, and I think also a lot of the ways that Lightning channels deal with fees is currently bad. And things like ARC just make those discussions even more complex. So, you know, it's, it's good stuff to have people researching on it, but I'm not excited about any of it. So with the one exception of RGB, which is a drastically different security model, and, you know, I think RGB is entirely insulated from so many of these problems. Now, am I excited about trying to put Bitcoin on RGB? Well, that's a very hard problem. But certainly if you want to do NFTs on RGB, that seems like a problem we can solve pretty quickly. So, uh, you're basically saying that there's too much complexity in this new solution, so what you would like to see more instead of complexity is basically simplicity. So having a soft fork <laughs> that could allow these primitives to be built in a very general way. Uh, ironically, simplicity isn't simple. 
It, it really isn't like trying to actually use simplicity is very complex and also in practice. Um, a simplicity software would not be enough because you would actually need to implement simplicity and then implement all the, I think the term was jets, um, to actually make things we would do with simplicity efficient enough to work in practice. I think the role of simplicity is better suited to being a way of formalizing scripting. Um, mathematically to let you go prove things about it and so on, but I don't think it replaces like the endless pile of software which people want. Adam, do you agree that simplicity is complex? Uh, yeah, I mean, actually it's interesting watching people try to understand it because first of all, like the system engineers and core developers have to understand what Russell O'Connor is saying and then they have to translate it so that developers can understand it and then you have to explain it, so it's kind of a multi-stage thing because uh, it's because it's using um, sort of uh, these proof of systems and logic languages which is a very specialized area of computer science that most people are not familiar with, so it's kind of a learning curve. But um, in terms of, I mean, the claim to simplicity because there are nine operators, so you can, it wouldn't take you very long to understand the operators, but that's just like learning Boolean algebra and then saying, oh, it's obvious you can build a CPU from this, right? So, yeah. Yeah, you can build a CPU out of Conway's Game of Life, too. Yeah, so, so I understand, like, the, the low-level parts are simple, but composing that into a working system is complicated, but uh, there are, you know, there's two people working on this for quite a while now, and they've made, they've implemented a lot of jets at this point. They're working on uh, sort of middle, like a slightly higher level language. So all jets that will replicate at least the major Bitcoin and liquid function, right? So the, all the, of course, that we already have uh, will, will be already implemented as jets. Yeah, I mean, the idea is to have jets for basically most of the sort of Bitcoin internal hardware functions that are not visible in the opcodes but are necessary to implement the opcodes like hashing, signatures and elliptic curve operations and introspection in a generalized way so that it should be you know, possible to do those things and uh, also jets of common like higher level operations like adding and multiplying because simplicity is really kind of bit logic level and so even an adder is a needs a jet clearly. Um, and signature verification and that kind of thing. So I think realistically, you know, with the simplicity, even today, you could implement like a short signature without needing a jet because you're just you know, you're calling the hash rate, you're making it, calling a few introspectors, and then it's it's compact enough to use as is. But where you need to implement a new jet is if you were implementing. I don't know, a new kind of signature that uses a different field or something that the Bitcoin libraries just don't have for it, and then you read it. Um, but I think, you know, about the uh, activatability of, of something like simplicity, um, I mean, of course, we're going to try to do it on liquid first so nobody can predict what, what Bitcoin consensus will be, but I have observed some, like, some observations about that is it seems that when there are design choices, there's a sort of constraint, which is, you know, using covenants as an example, right? There are, I know CTV has had the most noise made about the controversy in the past, but there are literally maybe half a dozen or more alternatives. And so the debate becomes heated because people really want to use the optimal one, the one that has the most flexibility, that fits well, that can cover most use cases. And so they will, it's really just a debate about sort of language evolution, right? adding an opcode, which opcode you add. Whereas if you ask somebody, do you want Bitcoin to be extensible? Like, okay, and there's not really that many free choices because there's any sort of out of nine operators. And I think there's also a kind of widespread enthusiasm to see Bitcoin ossify because change is dangerous. Right? It, it invites a political argument, and eventually as Bitcoin grows bigger, maybe government like financial organizations have views, right? So, Ossifying is good, and I think simplicity is the best chance we have of ossifying. Peter, before we react to this, uh, that you, you say whatever you want, but I want to, I do remember correctly that you also tried to imagine a more general formalism for a speaker. You were calling it text, right? So the idea that generally, generalized... Yeah, that wasn't was for Bitcoin, though. <clears throat> so the purpose of that was for digital signatures for, like, identity stuff and, like, PGP replacements. In fact, for Bitcoin, um, you know, one of the things that I'm sort of skeptical about with simplicity is sort of the opposite end of that, which is 
the fact it can do all these things could easily prove to be very harmful. You know, with Bitcoin, a lot of end cases. Um, one really basic example is we've made it very, well, we've made it possible in Bitcoin script to write a transaction that becomes invalid after a blockout. And that's why they consider it to be very important because otherwise, in a reorg, you could have a real disaster where transactions no longer can be mined at all because they're now too far into the future. And it's very easy and simplicity to wind up creating an introspection system that allows you to break that. So the base level of simplicity, curiously, given like the level of it, it preserves that uh, sort of monad semantic of Bitcoin uh, script, effectively, which is sort of surprising, but that's what Russell says it does. Of course, you can imagine the introspection gone crazy that could break that. Maxim, you were uh, also building some kind of generalized uh, uh, script version, like a contract on top of uh, a long VM. Uh, the, why, why, one of the criticisms that I heard you uh, give to the current state of the ecosystem is that uh, even before we make a script to become a bit more extensive, we are still have a lot of troubles formalizing and standardizing the current script, like with mini script and descriptors. So, so uh, would you, wouldn't you agree with the original Alec's point about uh, finishing what we already have before creating new, new ideas, new more generalizations? Because like, we cannot, so basically, would you agree that we cannot even properly describe and standardize current scripting capabilities? Mm. I, I would approach this question from a different direction. What I think is a set of axioms, which actually we agree with you, Giacomo, as well. And the first of these axioms is that uh, layer one must be as simple as possible and as simplified as possible. Uh, the second axiom, and for me, the simplest uh, layer one is the stateless, scriptless layer one which can be done with a client-side validation. We don't need everybody to validate everything. That simply doesn't scale, that simply doesn't private, is not private. And simplicity can't solve this problem. So it's an interesting experiment, and I'd love to actually see it, but I wouldn't bet on it as a factor for the Bitcoin success. The second axiom is that avoid softworks requirements. If they happen, it's okay, but don't put any, like, we are trying to develop technology which is 100% independent from whether certain software will happen or not happen. So everything that we do from RGB to everything else is not requiring any software. And with that kind of, uh, I do believe that if you create a proof of publication layer, one, specifically not for money, but just for provable forms of computing, scalable computing, that's what can be ossified, that what doesn't need to have any scripting engine, and that is most safe and private approach. And not try to make it out of Bitcoin blockchain, just make something by, on the site without opcodes, and if it gets eventually adopted, because it provides the value of this provable, comp scalable computing, then there will be a way one day how to move Bitcoin there, even if it could be the software, but again, don't try to push the software. If people will need it, they will do that. Otherwise, product provides some crypto-economical means, like economical gameplay, which can help early adopters to, to, to test that. Uh, regarding the virtual machine, well, uh, unfortunately, we had to develop our virtual machine for RGB, because uh, we would like to have a rich state and statefulness and operations, and none of the existing virtual machines wasn't the thing that actually can work in the conditions where you don't have a, a random memory access, for instance. And so of course we can't take UEM because it's an account-based model, so there is nothing in between. It was, we had a random memory access, simplicity wasn't there yet. So they did a very simple registry-based virtual machine in a functional style, where like you know, there is no exceptions. If you divide by zero, you will get uh, just an optional with a none value instead of like exception in the program, so that makes it pretty pretty different from all existing virtual machines. Uh, question for Adam and Alecos actually, because uh, since uh, Alecos you're working on uh, hardware, and that reminds me that uh, among the 
among the different primitives that Peter was uh, listing, even if Peter uh, in the past did comment a lot about uh, uh, T chains and uh, secure enclaves and trusted computing. Like when Alfini wanted to go and solve uh, the problem of double spending, he was basically betting on uh, trusted computing and uh, secure, uh, secure hardware, a remote at the station. So in a way, um, uh, there, we are basically only assuming software solutions, but what Liquid came up with at the beginning was uh, actually a trusted computing system with uh, this kind of federated machines that are tamper resistant to some level. And uh, I, I could argue that a, a kind of UTXO sharing would be just charging an open dime and passing it out uh, by hand. So, uh, do you uh, well? Do any of you think that uh, hardware may play a huge role? And if so, how do you actually go at this uh, and this decentralize that? Because the de dependency on a single hardware producer, producer and on the supply chain would be huge in that case. So, in your case, that do you like like? Uh, uh, beer, physical beer and history in Bitcoin, do you think that would ever be a thing or uh, you see hardware just for hardware wallets, personal and there is no way that can improve uh, exchanges? And if Thank you want you. to step in uh, as you as wish. Uh, so, um, well, Peter could also say, I think, a lot about hardware. Um, I'm very skeptical about that. Uh, I think hardware can can be used, like it wouldn't be the entire system relying on, on the hardware. So hardware can be used at a local kind of scale. So me and I can agree that we both trust uh, the open dime, not trusting, I don't really mean trusting the manufacturer uh, of open dime, I mean uh, coin kite. I mean going down layers and layers of trusting the hardware designer and then trusting the fab that produced the hardware and then trusting the shipping company that shipped the hardware. So there are so many layers that you cannot really remove in any way. Um, and even you know, secure elements and stuff, they are pretty secure, but it's not a guarantee. You cannot formally prove that the secure element is secure. Uh, even assuming the production is uh, on, the producer is 100% honest, and the shipment company is 100% honest, uh, it is still you know, physical, uh, physical phenomena that you need to, you can put barriers in place, you can say, oh, if you try to glitch the power in this way, I'm going to put this protection, but maybe there's another way of glitching power, and you didn't, uh, didn't predict it. So I think in general, other cannot 100% be trusted, but it can be trusted at kind of a local level. So I wouldn't be the entire system on, on the map itself. Yeah. Peter? Yeah, I actually point out that um, trusted hardware is actually used in lightning right now. Because Phoenix, uh, well, the company behind it, of course, ASIC, um, according to what they claim, and according to, of course, what Amazon claims, uh, they go use an Amazon trusted hardware solution whose name is, um, I'm forgetting. And the reason why they do this is really because they have an enormous amount of money on one, well, to be exact, a cluster of nodes running at uh, Amazon, and they want to ensure that it doesn't get stolen. And that is, you know, helps Lightning a lot by allowing one of the largest Lightning nodes in existence to exist and making it comfortable for that company to run it. Of course, being all trusted, I mean, Phoenix themselves, like, they don't know if its hardware is real. You know, none, none of us can really tell if Amazon actually went to the trouble of making trusted hardware. You know, you can't publicly buy it, you can't examine it, you just get a whole bunch of claims from Amazon. Now, certainly if it was broken on a big scale, you'd probably get some very interesting stuff coming out in lawsuits, because they'd probably be forced to disclose a lot, but, you know, the, the trust issue there is very real, and it's certainly better suited to be a belt and suspenders type of solution. I would be very, very, very hesitant to do something like mobile coin, where, you know, consensus is directly tied to trusted hardware. So that also means that uh, in a parallel world where uh, lighting is banned uh, in the United States and Europe, uh, Ascent would not probably not provide with a Tor uh, on your site the same level of uh, UX that they can provide with an Amazon servers, right? So, that the, the yeah, UX yeah. we have is dependent on the fact that we have Amazon inside. Yeah, I mean, they're, you know, there are alternatives to using Amazon, but like the, the fact is that they are buying into an ecosystem which is hard to quickly change on a dime, and it's controlled by a small, small number of people. Of course, the first thing I find acceptable, because you know, Phoenix is just one wallet, there are alternatives, but from their point of view, it definitely is a risk. 
Adam, I, I remember that at the beginning of Liquid, the, the focus on secure hardware was very, very high, the, uh, very, very high. I also remember the jokes about the termites that could explode. And uh, so right now, uh, I hear a lot of focus on, uh, the, like, uh, I heard recently more focus on dynamic federation, different kind of federation organization, but a little, a little bit less about the specific hardware tools. Uh, have you grown more skeptical about what you can do with hardware, or you still think that could be like one key focus for the future? Yeah, I mean, uh, I think you've seen the, uh, the secure elements in hardware wallets get broken a number of times, just uh, like a fuse that was supposed to stop rewriting, actually it was just broke, it didn't, and you know, then the hardware wallet manufacturer scrambling to walk around or wait for the next version of the chip. So, even though these secure elements are used for very high assurance, non-crypto use cases, apparently they can have just gross functional bugs or security bugs. Um, so it's very hard to rely on them, and they're close, like they typically want it in DNA. And so Stoshi Labs is working on an open spec, open source secure element, which is interesting, but also not a guarantee that it gets bugs. But I do think like physical hosting, like there's a lot of stuff in Amazon. If Amazon ever gets compromised really inside a lot of Bitcoin exchanges and companies can have a problem. Some of them are actually using physical infrastructure, like their own data center or just a high security physical data center that they have access to. And I think, you know, access control does play a part in physical security because, you know, if there's a company with 100 people in there, you don't want all 100 people to get out of the hardware. So, you know, there's a machine room, only people with the need to access it are supposed to be able to get into the machine room, and so there's things called an IPS, which is basically a heavy duty safe to put machines inside of it. And some people run machines in there. It's not an HSM, but it's kind of an HSM, right? It's like, you've got to like, cut through this thing to get, to it, to get through a door with security cameras and things. So I think Physical board, basically. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, it's like a meter cubed vault that you can put a few servers in, and some of them have a heat pump, so it can like, transfer heat out without too much risk of water getting in that kind of thing. So, I think it's, it's part of the formula. It's, of course, you know, you can still have a mission impossible, or the insiders can just be like FTX, like outright, you know, desiring to steal all the funds. And I think for exchanges particularly, there's an answering having you know, something like a liquid uh, trustless swap and trustless limit order that side swap implemented it in TDEX and so on, which is that you can have limit orders executed by a central order book without the central order book having custody. And that's a step forward. It's actually kind of a shame that 99.9% you know, of exchange traffic is not benefiting from blockchain at all, it's just a custodial technology. Uh, I should point out with um, the cargo security, there's you know, two sort of big categories where you can kind of fit this stuff into. And one is hardware security for the purpose of protecting yourself. And there's hardware security for the purpose of convincing others. And, you know, where that difference comes into is the term remote attestation. And there are a very, very, very small number of devices out there, um, Intel SGX being one, that have the ability to convince someone else with a digital signature that a particular environment is running within the device, um, namely the you know, hash of the software that runs in the initial state. Um, in Intel SGX, the theory lets you do that on Intel systems, it's been broken multiple times. Um, Intel has designed it in such a way that it's incredibly dubious, it makes anyone look like they're obviously trying to go back toward it. Like it's, it is such utter hot garbage, it's amazing that uh, they've had it for so long. But if it did what it did, you would be able to do things like run a server and convince other people that the software running on that server was what it claimed to be. And in that environment, it lets you do stuff like order books that promise not to um, allow people front run, or you could promise things like just straight up double spend protection. Like the coins are secure because we're not gonna allow them to be double spent. I mean, famously Hal Finney did this with a very old um, IBM HSM many years back. Of course, getting access to those things is the easiest basic possible. But the category I talked about with async, from the point of view of external people, that falls into the first category of, well, they know that their thing is secure, but they're not in a position to really prove it to others. I mean, the way Amazon's implemented their HSMs, 
finalized and approved to others, but there's a lot of caveats there. But certainly, like things like you know, physical computers and vaults, that's mainly about, hey, I, I know I set up the vault, I know what I put in there. It's still saying the vault has been tampered with. And, you know, while I think that's not as groundbreaking as um, remote attestation, potentially, it's certainly something a lot more places should use. And fortunately, though, uh, i got to point out, just because, you know, the exchange's IP addresses resolved to say Amazon, doesn't necessarily mean the hardware is actually on Amazon. I know examples where, you know, they use Amazon VPSs, but the traffic actually goes back to backend servers. But certainly not everyone does that. Yeah. I don't think most people use cloud and even don't have physical facilities. I mean, one of the funniest examples I've seen was where they went to all the effort of doing a very well done HSM and a security room, et cetera, et cetera. But the Git repo for the code for the HSM was hosted on Amazon. They didn't have PGP on the Git commits. Yeah, I mean, I think kind of that area where well, even though like physical security without remote attestation doesn't convince the beneficiary and the users of the system, um, it helps a bit in the federation because like realistically, each organization is kind of semi honest right? You know, either it's like completely corrupt, but there are multiple people in the federation, and your working assumption is that you know at least the management of a third of them are honest or something. Now, the, um, and so, but they have rogue employees that are possibly infiltrated by bad actors, and so these kind of physical controls protect them a bit from this, from like the rogue elements of themselves. And while you can't verify that, you can sort of roughly generally assume that they're not all lying. Like that, you know, there are people in those companies who have seen the physical thing, and it's not a fake. Unlike, uh, you know, Theranos, for example. And you know, I got put this like that kind of security makes it a lot easier to run these services. You know, I mean, I personally um, am part of the team that runs over timestamps. And something we would like to do is add trusted timestamping to open timestamps. But trusted timestamping is sketchy because it you know, makes us a target to go fake, fake timestamps. And I think a, a prerequisite to me doing this in production is I want to go build custom hardware that is tamper resistant. So I set it up once, you set it up for a campaign of say the next 10 years, and it would run independently, such that if I personally tried to open up the hardware and modify it, it would wipe the keys. You know, I do not want to be in a position where someone could just go and point a gun to my head and say, hey, go, you know, go sign something different. I want to be able to honestly say to them, yeah, if I open that box, the keys are wiped, and there's nothing I can do about that. Yeah, there's actually a Bitcoin layer too that has that kind of security model, which is basically an honest player you assume, you assume is honest is operating something, but there is, you know, as long as they're honest, but they can be coerced, you're protected from their sort of future dishonest self, right? Which is because they're coerced, and that's the state chain system, right? If they were dishonest, they could, you know, prepare to steal the funds by being in the path of the state chain. But if they're honest, and they get coerced later, everybody can even actually withdraw when it goes wrong. But the problem in the system you described is how do you prove to somebody else outside that you are actually running? So it's like, that that can, can easy, not be easy. I can't prove. Yeah. Like in this example, I can't. But it was certainly making me a lot more comfortable running the service to begin with. And you know, the more accessible that type of tech is to more people, I think the easier it will be for more companies to get into running Bitcoin-related services. I mean, I guess also a matter of standards. Like if you go in a jewelry and the guy says, "I cannot open the thing." You cannot trust it because many people do the same and it's based on standards, not just your weird excuse. Well, I mean, a good example of that in the physical world is it's extremely common for things like convenience stores to have time lock safes. And, you know, many banks do this as well, where it's just, it is impossible to open the safe with anything other than actual force until the time lock expires and the, the literal physical clock ticks over and lets the safe door be opened. Well, in Bitcoin, you can say you have a CTL, uh, I meant like a CTLB, but uh, the attacker can just keep beating you up because he doesn't believe it. Yeah, I was just mentioning this because I think the distinction Peter made was really interesting. So there's these two kind of categories, and going back to your first question about can we build the system just on like trusted hardware, you would need a perfect second category, perfect remote attestation, and as far as I know, nobody's figured out 
how to do it. And once you figure out perfectly how to do one, how to, how to keep things secure, and then on top of it, you also need to prove to the outside world that you're running something uh, perfectly. So, I don't know. Again, I, I don't think you can build the system on that. But locally, like async can trust, it. They, they can make this choice and they, they feel like they, uh, they feel more secure doing this, and that's perfectly reasonable. But as a system, you cannot rely on that. If you all agree and don't have anything uh, you should do, other will uh, give the audience uh, okay, that's it, go. Uh, I'd like to have one last note regarding the layer, uh, layers on top of Bitcoin, specifically regarding Lightning Network is that I think the main reason why we don't have a lot of progress in this area, we have a great ideas, a lot of ideas, factories, things like arcs and so on, but we don't have a lot of experiments with even things which can be done without the software. And the reason we don't have that is I think that the Lightning Network is not as it is of today. It's not made of composable components, such that you can replace some of them and play, for instance, with the PDLCs instead of HDLCs, or try some other routing, or different construction of the uh, channel transactions, or composability of the channels on top of each other. And this can be done quite easily if it was done from the day one. But the Lightning Network is committed to a very specific structure of the channels and everything around them. And that's why I think that one of the challenges and important things which need to be done is unlocking this potential of composability for the layers on top of Bitcoin instead of trying to refactor the legacy. I mean, keep in mind that the main Lightning implementation is LD, which is written in Go, which just doesn't have very good programming sports for that kind of composability. You know, if it was written in Rust, this might be a different story. Uh, the Rust one seems like Okay, so we have very few minutes, so uh, I will... Uh, do you have another mic? Okay. A few questions from the audience? Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for a very interesting panel, gentlemen. Question for all of you. Um, we have been talking at building all this layer 2, layer 1.5, layer 3 solutions to the Bitcoin, uh, which kind of got me the vibe of like we are moving into the web 3, web 5, web 6, web X space because of one thing. We never described and defined what is a layer 2, what is a layer 1 and a half, what is a layer 3. So please, definition of layer 2. Well, I, I like using the definition that it's really about the security model, where layer 1 is passive security, where you are in a position where something is committed on a chain, and as more blocks happen, that's what keeps you secure. Whereas layer two is some other alternative security model where what keeps your money secure is something different, like say, um, Shaman Bank, or say a lightning punishment, you know, justice um, correction scheme, or you know, something along those lines, because I think that's the biggest difference. And notably in that model, I don't really consider RGB layer two. I consider it much closer to a layer one, maybe a layer 1.5, because ultimately the security, until of course you add lightning channels to it, is all about going back to the blockchain and proving some data directly. I mean, I'm not a panelist, but uh, my take on that, I mean, I have strong opinions about the terminology. My take on that is that another very important distinction between layers would be something like the, the way the layers are used in architecture, when you have the shearing layer, where the layer, the base layer are things that must be very uniform and very stable, while where you go on top, you can do stuff that are then change more, that have a faster evolution, and they split the branch into a, a variety of competing solutions. So you have this, the foundation will, will uh, last for centuries, and will be just one, but the furniture will be changed every few months and you can have many competing providers. So that's not about security, it's more about, about, about like time and, 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 fresh, uh, and like uh, variety, but it's a very important kind of... Uh, of course, during the block size wars, you could have had people argue that layer zero in that case is the header chain. Yes, exactly, the header chain. Uh, 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 the, the, the great technical resource I would suggest you for layers, Olga, is actually a Monty Python sketch. It's called the, the, the Society for Putting Things on Top of Other Things. It's beautiful, very technical. I would suggest everybody to watch it. Uh, I have a very simple take on layers. So, layer 2 is a, a, anything that solves the problem of layer 1. And there is layer 3 that tries to solve the problems that layer 2 introduced while solving the problems of the layer 1. So that's the way it actually works. 
Uh, I will say for me, I'm much more of a practical kind of guy. I don't spend time on philosophical discussions. I would just say layer two is anything that anchors itself, uh, or let's say a higher layer is anything that anchors itself on the lower layer. So lightning is a layer two because it sends ultimately Bitcoin transactions. Open timestamps is a layer two. So Peter was focusing a lot on the economical side. So where what's, your, what's the security of your money? But in Bitcoin, we also have protocols that don't really involve money at all. Um, so yeah. So just a dependency question, yeah, basically. Yeah, very practical. Kind of dependency, very dependency very relationship. Because you cannot really have cycles, so that, that provides a very clear distinction, I think. Adam, what is the idea? Um, I mean, so far it seems to be that effectively um, any layer 2 inherently makes a security trade-off because, I mean, I'll be wise, because if, if there was a way to get you know, an optimization or an improvement in layer 1, we would have done it. Because we're adopting it, right? So anything that is safe to add to layer one makes sense, gets them. And things which are forced to make security trade-offs, well, people do more provisional things on layer two. I mean, I, I think that's a good definition because you know having transactions at all was a security trade-off. Like we should have just had a big orgy of hashing on layer zero without all this pesky had to pay for it. Right. So the real layer is inside of you. Uh, yeah. We have time for the last question, Angelix. Yes, okay. I have a following up question specifically for Peter. Um, in your talk, which was an overview of layer twos, you mentioned multiple times coin joints and e cash, which kind of contradicts what you just said was the definition of layer two. But my talk wasn't about layer twos, it was about scaling. The title was The Big Ideas in Scaling. I didn't actually say what layer any of this stuff was on. Ha! Okay, my bad. I think it's an interesting open question about whether you could have a, something like a Jornian bank type of thing. Uh, so one of the problems with those, and, and the federated versions like Fedimin and Cashew, the single server version, is that you sort of inherently lose auditability as a side effect of the privacy feature. Like the binding prevents auditability, and therefore the central server or you know, the colluding federation subset can create extra coins for themselves in a hidden inflation and you won't find out until you know, two people try to take money out of the peg and there's not enough bitcoins there. Which interesting, before we go to the other question, this would, could also be considered some kind of weakness uh, about, well, not to the same level of cash, but in uh, something like client like validation, the guarantees against inflation bug, one could say, are weaker, like in uh, like in uh, Monero or Zcash shielded uh, pool, would you agree that there are? Oh, I would absolutely agree. Um, I, I think like any client side validation thing, it has the same general category of risks as something like Zcash, where it is much less clear if the inflation over the whole system is still, is still correct. Now I'd say it's potentially a lot less risky than Zcash and that the math behind it can be much simpler. But certainly, if you do say an RGB where you make the proof size smaller with zero knowledge proofs, then it's you know it's the same security issues as uh, Zcash with respect to undetected inflation, and that's you know that's one of the trade-offs you make, which is a good argument in you know Adam Back's model for calling it like a layer 1.5. Yeah. Last question. I'm oh, sorry, Adam. You were adding something. Well, I was going to say that I think there are indications that it is that it will be possible ultimately to. Uh, make zero knowledge proofs that no inflation has happened. But the, the Chromium thing doesn't provide that, right? It's just uh, in conflict with auditability. But like zero cash and Zcash are alternative proofs, but they don't scale that well. Like the, the coins are large, there's log scale going on in there, and they're making novel security assumptions to make it work at all, which are you know risky from Bitcoin's perspective. But you know the blockstream research guys with Bulletproof Plus Plus think you could implement uh, like a, Z, a Zcash like thing using that. Um, and that has that type of system that has auditability, right? You're relying on well, it, it doesn't have audibility in the way Bitcoin does. I mean, no, Bitcoin's it's audibility is with math simple enough, uh, you know, an elementary school. Addition, you could figure that to do addition and you see how much. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and, and I'll make the point though, like 30 years ago, Bitcoin wouldn't have had much audibility in the sense that we didn't really know if hash functions worked. But because math has proved and hash functions can be used and be broken, we have much better confidence. I'm sure in you know, 50 years, we'll have much better confidence with uh, zero knowledge proofs, or we'll realize they don't work at all. 
you know, one of those, if you have math assumptions, but also software implementation assumptions that you will need time to, uh, to basically get. Yeah, I mean, I, um, think, I think the proofs are okay because you're basically trusting ECDSA, the bulletproofs are made out of the different blocks. So trust the math. I know, I know you can't do it manually, but... I trust the math more than I do the programmers. <laughs> the very last question. What do you think about the uh, uh, drive chain? <laughs> <laughs> okay, we can make it quick, but yeah. Well, I didn't mention drive chains in my talk because they're not a scaling solution. And unlike something like, say, uh, coin join, which I briefly mentioned as an example of, you know, certain techniques, drive chains is just useless, so. <laughs> I don't have an opinion. I haven't studied drive chains yet, so uh, yeah, can't comment on that. Uh, drive chains are actually require software and there are like two of them and both of them can be avoided so you can have a merge mining with a single use seals without any software and dependency on miners and you can also have a cryptoeconomically secure pack which is better than miner secure pack with, with the radiant so just like marketing budget uh, spent on doing something that is not needed, it can be done in an easier way. To, to be clear, drive chains do not require a soft fork. The well, drive, the chain proposal, all, drive chain proposal, yes, as the drive chain does. proposal does, because it gives a specific number for how many miners have to agree over a certain amount of time. But I mean, Paul Stork has literally gone and said that you could implement drive chains now by you know crossing your fingers and opening miners and steal from you. I mean, is that any different after it's activated? Well, it takes more miners to agree over a long period of time, but it's not fundamentally different. Yeah, I guess that's true, right? The time looks of the uh, counters. But, yeah, I mean, just to play devs, I get to explain uh, drag chains. I think it's a kind of simplified version of the original fraud proof based bit I chained. And the evolution in thinking comes from uh, economic game theory, which is Paul's background. It's literally an academic economic game theorist from Yale, I think. And so it's interesting to listen to his arguments because he'll arrive at sometimes the same conclusion via economics that we might arrive at via like, computer science. And the computer science point of view always wants a kind of ironclad mathematical proof, whereas the economic game theorist just kind of shrugs and says, well, the market will decide the market's right. And so he'll say things like, well, if that drive chain failed, then economically it wasn't viable, and that's fine. Right? But in practice, people have lost a lot of money in the process, so to our point of view, that's not fine. We, we, I think we, the coin technical community more prefers um, like pr prevention rather than economic punishment after the fact. I mean, I'd say my criticism of drive chains is not actually the problem that people lose money. That's actually not the problem I'm concerned about. The problem is that people will not lose money because miners will be coerced and you know, in some cases forced to go do things to make the drive chains work anyway, even though they're secure. And of course, the most obvious way to you know, fix a drive chain that doesn't work is to add the drive chain rules to Bitcoin. And thus, now you've done a soft fork and they've done a massive block size increase, potentially. And I think if, you know, drive chains actually caught on and got used for scaling, like Paul and other advocates want it to be, it's quite likely that some would start to go fail. Um, probably most likely in the actually somewhat quote unquote benign failure mode of well people don't validate them and thus the withdrawals don't work. And before long you wind up in a position where big big, you know, mining pools are forcing them to work, tension under court orders, and now all the Bitcoin's screwed up because now to run a full node, you now need to have all this extra drive chain code and drive chain data. I mean the, the practical failure mode is that there's a collusion of miners to take the coins even though there's you know, this opcode, right? And I mean, one of the things they're discussing is to, I don't, I don't know if I'm seriously discussing it, but it's uh, like, say, I don't think that's a practical failure mode. I think that's a theoretical failure mode that drives a real failure mode. No, I understand what you're saying, but I'm getting to it in stages, right? So the first, the first thing is that it will take a collusion of miners to steal the coins. And of course, the miners are quite big now. The pools are quite big. And so it will be kind of obvious that, you know, just by like voting 
numbers and well, it's this pool plus this pool plus this pool, or that pool plus that pool, most of them mark their blocks. So are they actually going to do it? Maybe not, but nevertheless it's still a bad idea because it invites politics and sort of retroactive reactions to economic situations, which you, know, you don't want politics, it should be more mathematical and uh, apolitical processes and blocks. Um, so, yeah, I think that the, the other idea that is probably risky is that the dispute resolution process is you, is it's just the pick out slow, so everybody can see this theft happening in slow motion, and then the users have to enact a user activate software to stop it, because they can't rely on minus to stop it, because definitionally those are the guys that still the coins. So I don't know how realistic that scenario is, but if that was realistic, then the user activated software is a pretty dramatic, dangerous thing to impose on users who didn't opt in to want to use the drive chain. So I think that's it. I'll also point out that drive chain's proposal self from Paul Stork. Um, there are a lot of more technical aspects to it that they're actually just really broken on their own. Um, you know, one example is the way that the commitments are made in blind merge mining allows equivocation attacks, which is a kind of attack that was noticed in merge mining like literally over 10 years ago. And it's just amazing that that kind of mistake would get made again. And also, it's also notable that this hasn't, as far as I know, been noticed by anyone else, which really says that no one competence ever bothered looking at it. So I hope that this uh, Galaxy Brain panel uh, helped you to burn calories of yesterday because now there is the last. Please give a, a big round of applause for the panel.